Hi, um, my name is Gary Marcus, and I'm a professor of psychology at New York, New York University. Um, I'm the author of the book The Birth of the Mind and Kluge. It's my newest book, and consider myself to be a theoretical cognitive scientist, interested in sort of how the interested in the big picture and how all the little pieces fit together. So I try to bring together biology, psychology, linguistics, philosophy, and computer science, and, and make an integrated picture of how the human mind works. The kludge is a clumsier, inelegant solution to a problem. You can think about MacGyver and sort of you know putting uh, shoes together out of duct tape and floor mats, uh, or you can think of Rube Goldberg. It's it's assembling something. It gets the job done, but in, in a sort of clumsy fashion. The way I came to it was my earlier book, The Birth of the Mind, which was about genes and innateness and the environment and, and how, how um, the brain develops over time. And when I was writing that book, <coughs> pardon, when I was writing that book, I got very interested in evolution, since genetics are, after all, all the product of evolution. And what I realized is that evolution is really stingy. It keeps using the same genes over and over again. It very rarely starts from scratch. And what that means, if you very rarely start from scratch, is you're going to make mistakes, because sometimes you'd be better off if you overhauled things, if you started from scratch. And evolution doesn't have hindsight, it doesn't have foresight, it doesn't realize when it might be a sensible thing to start from scratch. And so that inevitably means that evolution is like a tinkerer, um, and tinkerers build kludges. And so when I finished the last book, I kind of realized that, that I need to rethink a lot of my beliefs and to try to understand, you know, if, if the mind was a kludge, what would that mean? And, and um, it turns out there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fodder for that. There are a lot, a lot of clues in the human mind once you start going looking for them. Uh, e evolution, you know, some people think of it as a hill climber. It's always try as if it were always trying to get to the top of the mountain, but really it's sort of trying to get to the top of a mountain, wherever it happens to be in a mountain range. And it looks for things that are nearby that are better. It doesn't really look for anything, but the, the random process of evolution tends to lead evolution to climb nearby mountains, but not to realize that, that there are distant mountains that might be higher. So we're often pretty well evolved considering some starting point, but there's often some better starting point that you could at least imagine. There's an old um, saying that to a man who has a hammer, everything is a nail. And so I don't want to be accused of saying that everything about mental illness is a kludge. I certainly don't think that's the case. But I think that the idea of a kludge, the metaphor of a kludge, is, is really quite illuminating when you think about mental illness. So the first thing it tells you is you shouldn't start with a default assumption that everything in mental illness is sort of some optimal compromise. Um, so people talk about, well, maybe depression is an adaptation and it keeps you so that you're subordinate and keeps you out of trouble and, and things like that. And there, there may be some truth to that. There may be some compensating, um, compensating um, benefits when, when you have mental illness. A lot of mental illness stems, I think, from basic fault lines in the human mind. So there are things about the human mind for everybody that make all of us more vulnerable to mental illness. So a good example of this is the structure of human memory. The way our memory works is very different from the computer. In the computer, you can systematically search your memory. And um, in a human being, it's much less systematic. We, we have these cue systems. We get reminded of things based on the circumstances that we're in. So um, if you're sitting down right now when you're listening to me, you'll remember it better probably than later if you were standing up or swimming or something like that. So all these kind of random things can help remind you of, of what's going on. Some, Sometimes people call this cue-dependent memory or state-dependent memory. And one of the arguments I make in the book is that that actually contributes to mental illness. So you can think, for example, of cognitive behavior therapy and how people, um, how therapists try to help people with mental illness. And um, like someone who's depressed, the typical phenomenon is that they dwell on what they're depressed about. So um, they think about the negative things in life, and they, that you know one negative thing leads to another negative thing. You start listening to blues music and listening to breakup songs, and get into what I call a ruminative cycle. I don't know what the technical term for that is, um, but you get into these cycles where you're 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 just dwelling on the negative, and that's partly a function of memory. So what you would really like to be able to do is to search your memory systematically and say, well, yeah, I really did have a crappy week. It's true, but on the other hand, the month before that was pretty good, you know. But the mind isn't set up that way. The mind is set up to really focus on the last thing because that's how our memories work, even though that's not necessarily good for our mental health. So I mean, it's, it's good um, advice that I think cognitive behavior therapists give to try to have people, um, for example, avoid overgeneralizations. Um, as overgeneralizations come natural to us, it come, the natural thing for us to do is to overgeneralize from the last thing that happened. That can make us manic depressive too. It can make us um, go really up. One good thing happens, you're very excited. And, you know, I think the Buddhists probably had it right that what you really want to do is to sort of take a more even path, and, and that would be 
what a statistician might call a moving average that you're, you're looking at um, how you felt for a long time and not just this last minute. But our brains really aren't set up that way. So it's a constant struggle to do that. You don't get that for free. You don't get that sense of detachment and sort of looking at the big picture just by, just by being a human. You have to work at it to do that. There's a, a, a great um, saying from Harry Stack Sullivan, which is, we are all more human than otherwise. My mom taught me that. That's a great one. Um, um, so there's this great saying, we are all more human than otherwise. And I think that that's right. When you look at mental illness, it's the same fault lines that are underlying mental illness across all cultures. But then there are some cultural differences in, in how people cope with these things and, and how they express them and so forth. So um, I mean, there's some cases where something might seem like a mental illness in one culture and not another. So um, I forget the technical term for cross-dressing, gender dysphoria or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, in some cultures that's fine, in some cultures it's not. And so, you know, whether it gets labeled a mental illness sort of depends on your culture. But if you look at things like schizophrenia and depression and so forth, they, they occur in all cultures. Um, schizophrenia at a pretty consistent rate, um, depression maybe with a little bit more variability. I think that it's always the same fault lines that are underneath, but culture can give you ways of coping with these things. Um, at the extreme, in, in sort of sophisticated technological cultures, they can give you medication um, to try and deal with things. And... Um, I think that some cultures, for example, are more positive towards therapy than others, and, and therapy, I think, is clearly a good thing. Um, and so cultures can you know, vary in how they support people with mental illness. Um, cultural stressors can increase the incidence of mental illness, so if you put unreasonable demands on people, that's likely to accelerate the rate of mental illness. But again, we all sort of have the same human, human brains underlyingly. Cultures and kludges um, can interact in lots of different ways. So, one thing is that cultural stimuli, um, for example, accelerate the kinds of memory kludges that I'm talking about. So you have a memory system that is vulnerable to, say, dwelling on the negative things. If you're in a negative state, making you think about negative um, experiences and, and, and having that accelerate. But it depends on what experiences you have in the first place. So you have like an underlying vulnerability, but it really depends on a cultural trigger. Um, so I think a lot of kludges are like that. There, there may be accidents that are waiting to happen, but you need you know, some kind of... Um, stimulus from the environment to actually make, make them happen. Um, or ideally, um, you try to recognize that people are vulnerable and try to find ways of treating them. So still one of my favorite studies in the last six or seven years is a genetic study that showed that people with a particular variant of the MAOA gene, if they have the right variant, um, become more likely to become violent. But it depends on what culture they're raised in. So people that are raised in normal homes, if they have this particular um, sort of susceptibility locus, there's no, no apparent effect of it. Whereas people that are raised in an abusive home, um, those people tend to be more violent than people that don't have that allele. So in principle, you could, for example, modify your healthcare system in ways so that you would say, look, these people have a particular genetic vulnerability. It's especially important that we keep them out of um, certain kinds of situations because those are the people that are most likely to become um, violent. So it's a, it's a very interesting example of the gene environment interaction and it's also an interesting example of how we might ultimately use knowledge of people's individual genomes to help with mental health.